General Seidel, your uh, jobs in the Army were what? Well, I was basically a field artilleryman, but as my career progressed, I was in 35 years, I got increasingly involved in what we now call public relations. We call it information in those days due to a congressional stricture against using the word public relations. But uh, I was involved in, uh, in Europe in uh, media relations. I was the Department of Defense briefer, press briefer prior to going to Vietnam. In Vietnam, I was the Chief of Information for MACV, Military Assistance Command in Vietnam. And after that, I came back to the United States and I was the Chief of Information of the Army for four years, and after that, they made me Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs. So I had a pretty heavy dosage. Of well, you sound affairs. you sound to me like the authority on uh, the relationship between the military and the correspondents. You certainly had a lot to do with them. Is that true? Correct. That is correct. Well, what about that relationship? We've heard that an adversary relationship uh, developed in Vietnam. That the relations were pretty good in the early days, but as time went on, they the relations seem to deteriorate somewhat. What's your view? Well, my view is that an adversary relationship is a good thing. I think the press, uh, speaking of looking at it from the press side, they should have an adversary relationship. Now, I think the government should not consider it that way. They should try to be helpful. Uh, I think the thing to worry about, and, and what happened off and on in Vietnam, there was not a trend, incidentally, it was up and down, uh, was it became antagonistic sometimes. Fortunately, not while I was there, but it, it was antagonistic. On both sides? I would say so, yes, uh -huh. indeed. But it depends on the people, of course, mm -hmm. uh, in every case. Well, one of, the, one of the things that we have been told is that uh, at headquarters, the kind of information that came out in what was called the 5 o'clock follies, the 5 o'clock briefing each afternoon, was something quite different from what the correspondents learned in the field. Well, now I've heard that as a reporter reporting wars myself over the years, and maybe some truth to it. But uh, we've been told that it was somewhat filtered, not necessarily distorted, but it went through so many hands. What's your reaction? Well, I think there's some truth to that. The, uh, I think the 5 o'clock follies, which incidentally were rarely held at 5 o'clock, it was usually 445 <laughs> or 515 or something like that, but we all called it that. Uh, I think people have forgotten the purpose of the five o'clock follies. In Vietnam, in order to try to service the press, and this happened before I was there and while I was there and after, uh, we had a large crew of uh, public affairs officers uh, screening the reports coming into the command operations center at MACV headquarters uh, every day and every night. The first thing in the morning we would hand out, we would put down at the Just Pow building, which is where the briefings were held, the what happened during the night. And these were simply a distillation of what seemed to be interesting and important of actions taking place overnight. Then during the day, we would do the same thing, which we would then brief and hand out both at the five o'clock follies. So the type of information we were putting out was, was really attempting to be an update on what, ha what had happened in the last 12 hours. That was the whole point of it. Now, after the, the gentleman would brief on stage with maps and charts and all that good stuff, they would take questions. And this is where we got into arguments because my briefers, for example, and myself were the slaves of what we had seen in the reports. Of course, I had other places I attempted to get information too from the staff to beef it up a little bit with uh, more information, hopefully. Uh, but we would occasionally find a reporter who had just come in from the field with reference to a certain operation and it would, of course, be the one that had just happened. Uh, and he would ask a question about it, and the briefer would answer it as best he could. And the reporter would say, no, that isn't what happened. Well, in some cases, I think the reporter was right. In some cases, he was wrong. Because mm -hmm. you, you, one reporter out covering a large action, he can't find out everything either. So a little bit like the blind leading the blind. And uh, uh, we tried during my tenure there to service the press. In other words, my feeling was that the and this worked throughout my career. I think it's every, every public affairs officer must do this. He must consider himself a representative of the media to his commander, as well as a representative of the commander to the media. He's got a two-way street he's got to operate if he's going to be efficient and if he's going to minimize antagonism. Because if the, if the reporter feels that his contact in the government, namely the public affairs guy, is really trying to help him, you'd be surprised how good the relations get, especially if you are really trying to help him. Well, I think that's very important. Now, in some cases, this matter of servicing both sides, you 
a tie occurs, and then, of course, the commander wins. I mean, you know, you have to give him priority over the press. But uh, I found, and I've studied this extensively since I was in Vietnam, that uh, a lot depended on the personalities involved. It was a very personal thing. Were you in, uh, in Vietnam uh, at the time of the uh, My Lai affair? No, well, I was there. But believe me, I was the chief of information on in March of 68. Uh, and the, uh, the matter was not reported to MACV, nor did any newsmen find out about it. It was well covered up there in the America Division. You mean it's well hidden? Uh, hidden, covered it's up, not, I should Yeah, say. covered up. Cover, I thought the up. Well, I, uh, I talked with one reporter, I think it was John Lawrence of CBS. Mm -hmm. I, I asked him if he understood why the story broke in the United States, why it wasn't uh, dug out by the, by the reporters out there. And uh, as I recall his answer, he said, uh, because on that day there had been a report come in of uh, an engagement in which uh, I believe he said 200 Vietnamese had, had been killed. And he said, as I recall, that uh, Lieutenant Kelly had uh, made a false report. He had at least, he, he had said that the Vietnamese had died, but he did not say that it, was, it happened to be women and children, and that that misled them. Have you any recollection of that? I don't recall it, but it, it, was, it would be, certainly be logical. And I, I know this has been looked up, but I just don't, I was not involved in looking it up. But if such an action had been reported, we would have duly reported it at the 5 o'clock follies. We would have said, you know, 200 casualties or whatever. Uh, needless to say, let me say this, that had he talked about 200 women and children, that would not have, the meal, I think, would never have been put off that long. But uh, we have searched our souls on that, and I've talked to many reporters about it, and none of us can remember any hint of such a thing occurring at that time. Well, you know yourself that had anybody had a hint, everybody would have gone out, and, and the inspector general would have been there, 2,000 press corps. You know, that, uh, there's no question. But I, I, it was very successfully covered up. There's just no question about that. General, uh, what is your assessment of the quality of reporting that came out of the Vietnam War? That's a tough question. It, it varied. Uh, a lot of people call it standard mediocre. My personal opinion is that we had all kinds. We had uh, some excellent reporters there in large numbers. The trouble was during my tenure, which was 67, 68, 69, the uh, professional, the old pros who really did the good work were outnumbered by younger men, uh, men with less experience. You may recall in 68, the American Society of Newspaper Editors put out a report on the, both criticizing the quality of our work in Vietnam and the quality of the press. And there, some of the reasons they uh, gave were too many reporters out to make a name for themselves, and I, I agree with that, there were too many. Uh, too many inexperienced stringers and freelancers, and I certainly agree with that. There were a lot of people who came out there with the uh, at least initially acceptable credentials so that we had to accredit them. Uh, some turned out to be real estate salesmen, believe it or not. Uh, we caught a barber, a, a guitar player, and these were all, all posing as newsmen. Now the real estate salesmen, strangely enough, actually sent in some stories before we found out who they really were. Mm -hmm. I don't think they ever got used. But the, the people who caused the trouble were the inexperienced people with no military service, for example. You know, it's very, that was a complex war, both politically and economically and militarily. And you sent out a young fellow fresh out of college, uh, even with the best of intentions, and he's not going to be able to do a good job for a while. Uh, it's on the job training from your point of view, huh? At OJT, his readers are what, and viewers and listeners are the people who suffered while he was learning the job. And many of them did learn the job. Well, neglecting those people, let's talk about the professionals, yeah. the true professionals. What kind of a job did they do? Excellent, I think. I think. Except for one thing, and it's been well brought out at this seminar that the reporting at Tet was really pretty bad. Why? They got carried away. Well, I, I think we have to admit that Tet was a surprise. We knew about Tet was coming. In fact, we briefed the press on the background basis on this a number of times. Stories appeared in the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, the uh, Washington Star, U.S. News and World Report. Many. Uh, that Something big is going to happen at Tet. But what happened, the scope and magnitude of what happened surprised us even at MACV. Uh, 
we didn't expect them to be able to get so far into Saigon, for example. I had to run a roadblock on my way to work. You know, this is a, this this was a little shocking. Uh, so everybody was shocked, including the, including the newsmen. And uh, the thing where where the thing fell apart was from the news coverage, in my opinion, was that after the first week, there were really fighting only going on in uh, at most five places, and two of those were minor. Way. There was still heavy fighting. In fact, we lost way, you know, for a while. Uh, outskirts of Saigon and Quezon. Quezon, of course, had started before Tet. And I don't know whether you should count that or not. It lasted long after Tet. But the offensive was essentially over in a week, let's put it that way. But nowhere, and it certainly was all over by the 25th of or whatever day it was of February when Huey was recaptured. But I defy anyone to find more than one or two pieces where the reporter in, on the ground, the old pro, sat down and wrote a story saying, well, we may have overblown this a little bit. Here's what really happened. Surprise at first, quick defeat, smashing victory for the fr friendlies, the allies, terrible defeat for the Viet Cong, and it was terrible. They were never a military factor after that, and they lost a lot of their infrastructure, too. And uh, that didn't appear. Charlie Moore of the New York Times wrote a, wrote a piece like that, but I can't, I can't recall another one. And there should have been a whole spate of them, in my opinion, to rectify the exaggerated reporting at the start. People in the United States tell me who were here that, that they thought the Tet Offensive was still going on in March, where it was long gone. So that was a poor example. The rest of it, you get a varying opinions. I think it's in the eye of the beholder. The anti-war people thought it was pretty good. The uh, pro-war people, some of them thought it was bad. Some of the studies that I've looked at on television coverage, for example, you get both answers. Post-war television coverage, post-Tet television coverage. I, can, I don't remember where they are now, but there's one study that I read that did a very, both of them did a thorough job of looking at tapes, news tapes, from all the three networks, and uh, the, not PBS, but the other three, and uh, uh, came up with opposite conclusions. Mm -hmm. It's kind of how they, how they define good news, bad news, medium news. Uh, well, it, it it's tough, it's a tough yeah. answer. Uh, it has been said by some people that uh, the press contributed to losing the war in Vietnam. What's your reaction? Well, I, I think the only, I think that's probably true, but I, my main point is it was true with the Tet coverage. That's, it's very interesting that Roger Hillsman uh, yesterday agreed with that, and he was, he was there. He was in the access to the White House area and so forth. He said that the, and this has been my view all along too, it didn't affect the bad coverage at Tet did not affect American public opinion. That changes so slowly. In fact, it, the polls show that it, it, the 50, it didn't, the support of the war didn't go below 50% until the middle of 68, not immediately after Tet. In fact, it went a little, got a little better after Tet, the uh, support. But uh, my feeling was, and so was Roger Hillsman's, that it had an effect on the president. That kind of turned him off on the war. So if you accept that as a premise, then you can make a case that it did lose the war because of that. Would you say that the commander, General Westmoreland, or headquarters, seriously questioned the patriotism of any of the correspondents at any time? Some people did, but not the top people, no. I don't know of anyone who ever said anything like that. I worked for General Westmoreland and General Abrams, and then, of course, back in the States, I was still closely involved in the Vietnam War. I can't recall anyone seriously questioning or even saying anything about it, the patriotism. Now, at the lower levels, yes, I think some of the lieutenant colonels and majors and uh, maybe even colonels uh, in, with specific reporters would say, that guy's got to be a commie, yeah. mm -hmm. but not at the meaningful level. No, I, I don't recall that at all. General is a professional public information officer. How do you think, uh, what do you think of the future? What do you see? Are we, are we going to have uh, wars like the, the Falklands where the press is virtually excluded? What, is going to be the, what are going to be the rules of the game in the future? Well, it's going to depend on who's in, who's in command, you know, the, who's the president. The, uh, recently, and I can't remember whether it was the Carter administration or the Ford administration, but the the public, the censorship units, which were all Army Reserve units, have all been disbanded. And the theory behind that was we will not be, ever be able to have censorship again. 
in a U.S. military operation. But I think you would agree that if a president, who happened to be president at the time, said, let's have censorship, we're going to have censorship, or at least <laughs> they're going to make an attempt at it. I, I think uh, it's very hard to say. I would think if we went into a major war, heaven forbid, but non-nuclear, they would it would be logical for them to have censorship. I mean, troop movements and, and tactical affairs, they can't let that sort of thing be reported, and it's awfully hard to keep track of a lot of reporters, as I found out in Vietnam, where we had uh, 649 at one time in one month. That sort of information was handled on a self-censorship basis. Uh, ground rules. We ground rules it. in Vietnam. Did right. it work? I thought it worked very well. We, uh, we only had, well, now I, my statistical knowledge ends with the end of 1969, but at that time, we had only suspended the accreditation of four people. Now, this is from the beginning for violating the ground rules. Now, when you consider the thousands of reporters that we had over that period, uh, four people is pretty good. Thousands of reporters. Well, they we must had, have outnumbered the troops at times. Well, no, the most we ever had at any one month was 649. But that's a lot. Uh, we, we were averaging 400 during most of uh, 1968, and that's, that's a lot. Well, General, as a professional public information officer, it's spent years at this. What is your feeling at this time? Are you still a believer in the free press? Are you disillusioned with the American press? How do you sum it up? I am a very convinced believer in a free press. We must have a free press, and I think both the press and the government have got to do two things. I think the press have really got to ensure that they have professionals covering difficult stories. I think that's a must. I hope they realize that. I mean, for the good of the country. From the government standpoint, we've got to have a willingness to be candid. I don't say give away secrets or intelligence, but we are awfully, my experience has been, and has been working with a lot of administrations and a lot of people, that everybody hates to admit a mistake. And it's a perfectly natural thing, but for dealing with the press, it's one of the best things you can do. As you well know, if you dig up a story and you're a reporter for the Washington Post, you're going to keep pushing that story for a long time. But if I hand you the story and say, boy, we really goofed yesterday, you'll run it, but that's probably the end of it, the old one-day story. But anyway, with regard to your basic question, free press is a must. And I think the government has got to cooperate with us. 